next we are moving on to one of the important topics that is on esophageal perforations please don't forget esophageal perforations so very essential topic for your exam in this chapter this is a very favorite topic for national board examiners esophageal perforation i am going to discuss in detail so esophagus is 25 cm length can divide the esophagus into four parts cervical esophagus upper thoracic middle thoracic lower thoracic i will be discussing about them in cancer chapter but these are the four parts of esophagus cervical esophageal perforation is most common of all this among this perforations cervical esophageal perforation is the most common site of esophageal perforation is cervical esophagus can you tell me what is the most common cause why there is cervical esophageal perforation most common it is because of iatrogenic iatrogenic is the most common cause of esophageal perforation it is most common in the cervical esophagus if a patient I, I want to tell you some interesting points here if a patient swallows a foreign body foreign body patient swallows inside for example a patient swallows a coin what is the most common site this coin will go and stuck up can you tell me what is the most narrowest part of GIT where this coin will go and stuck up it will stuck up in the cricopharynx most common in cricopharynx please don't forget the most common site of this is in the cricopharynx at this place it will get locked if you are not going to remove it at the earliest it will jump into the esophagus it will jump into the trachea and it can cause a respiratory obstruction Okay, it is very important thing the most common foreign body obstruction is at the cricopharynx one point I want to tell you some MCQs another MCQ I want to tell you here is the most common foreign body most common foreign body in esophagus is what can you tell me what is the most common foreign body in the esophagus what foreign body you commonly get in esophagus very important simple question yes the most common foreign body in the esophagus is food bolus food bolus the food what you are eating no that can get obstructed on the way if there is a food bolus getting an obstruction there will be an underlying stricture or malignancy seen so please remember the most common foreign body obstructed in the esophagus is a food bolus please don't forget it is usually due to some stricture or growth in the pathway some stricture or growth in the pathway causes this issue please don't forget that point third point third question if a patient if a baby if a baby swallows a if a baby is going to swallow a battery button battery what are you going to do button battery i hope you know what is button battery that battery which will be seen inside the watch and all no that button battery when it is swallowed it is very dangerous because it can open anyway on the way anywhere on the way it will open up and it can cause perforation of the small bowel or stomach so button battery is swallowed wherever it is it is in the esophagus or it is in the stomach if you can if it is esophagus or stomach immediately you should retrieve it by endoscopic method endoscopic retrieval is advised if it is the esophagus and stomach i will advise you to remove it by endoscopy endoscopic retrieval is advised so button battery endoscopy esophagus and stomach go for endoscopic retrieval of the button battery and even if it is gone to the small intestine we have to remove it by surgery surgery advised if it is gone by even to the small intestine because anywhere it can open and it can cause danger otherwise any other foreign body which has crossed the cricopharynx as per norms any foreign body which has crossed the cricopharynx will usually come out if the foreign body has crossed the cricopharynx that is the most narrowest part only 13 millimeter diameter it is only 13 millimeter diameter if it has caused crossed the cricopharynx definitely it will not get obstructed anywhere it will come out please remember this point okay this is about the basics of esophageal thing now let me go on to the discussion of each this is one by one so let me discuss the causes of esophageal perforation and causes of esophageal damage one by one the first thing i am going to discuss is about the borehave syndrome i am going to discuss about borehave syndrome and another disease mallory v star simultaneously i am going to discuss these two diseases so let me bring our favorite patients mr ramu mr ramu and Mr. Somu, these are the two guys I will be using in the entire gastro system. These are the two guys going to explain us. Please note them by their hairstyle. This is Ramu, this is Somu. So Ramu will always be an unlucky fellow. He will be always unlucky. Most of the time whatever happens to him, he will die or he will go for bad situations. Somu is always a lucky fellow. He will be mostly successful in most of his projects because of pure luck. So what happens now? Most, Ramu and Somu both are friends. One day they get a military friend bringing them a big bottle of wine or brandy something some of their friend has got them 
and these two guys are having so many rounds one two three like that they are continuously drinking overnight same same brand same thing they are drinking and what happened suddenly ramu vomited ramu vomited and ramu collapsed ramu collapsed bp kuri pulse kuri he collapsed on vomiting pulse is kuri bp kuri is immediately shifted rushed to the hospital whereas somu is vomiting blood he is only vomiting blood and he himself walked to the hospital and he himself walked to the hospital this is having a normal bp normal pulse rate he is having no issue he is having only hematemesis if he also vomited and following vomiting he had a hematemesis so what actually happened to do, to these guys so the please remember the first point ramu had bor have syndrome somu had malary v star somu had a malary v star we are going to discuss about them in detail now what actually happened inside the anatomy i am going to explain you what happened inside this is esophagus now let us explain what are happening inside so both of them had so much of food particles everything so ramu vomited as ramu vomited you know what happened this is lower esophageal sphincter this is cricopharynx as ramu vomited the cricopharynx is very tightly closed it is tightly closed it is not opening as ramu is vomiting the cricopharynx is tightly closed and the food particles which are coming from here no they are trying to come here but they are unable to come out as vomiting therefore what happened they created a rent in the left lower left lower posterior esophagus left lower posterior esophagus there is a rent which happened that is rupture which happened and all the contents from here will enter the left side of the chest so please understand the pathophysiology ramu vomited against a closed glottis remember glottis and cricopharynx are tightly closed so we will mostly consider glottis as the best answer so glottis is tightly closed it is not opening so there is a rupture happening in the lower end of esophagus all the contents entered the left side chest cavity and the patient develops a triad known as macular triad macular triad is characterized by vomiting the patient had mr ramu had vomiting followed by chest pain he had and when you are going and examining his chest and all you can see the crepitus that is due to subcutaneous emphysema the air in the esophagus and all has come out and it has causing subcutaneous emphysema this is a classical mcq they develop macular triad so ramu develops macular triad due to vomiting chest pain subcutaneous emphysema and ramu is in a hardcore emergency immediately shift him to theater the golden period for doing surgery for ramu is within 24 hours we have to do surgery i will explain about the surgery later the golden period is within 24 hours surgery should be done for ramu otherwise he will face high mortality so now let us come to somu this guy somu what happened to somu in somu what happened let me explain you so in somu what happens here is this guy is also having the vomiting but he is very lucky his les is very tightly closed les is tightly closed the food particles inside the stomach they created pressure in the stomach only and they created a tear in exactly in this place exactly in this place so les is tightly closed so please remember les closed the food particles cannot come out of the stomach so the pressure increased created a tear at below og junction at lesser curve place at lesser curve so this is all same point this is the point there is the tear commonly seen malary v tear is commonly seen in the og junction below og junction at the lesser curve it can also have tear in the lower end of esophagus in proximal stomach everywhere it can develop but the most common tear is this is the most common site of tear that is the same place where we also get dilophoic lesion in discussion in later so that is the same place we also get dilophoic lesion that is a place we had developed a tear and it is only a partial tear it is not a full thickness tear like in a borav syndrome it is a partial tear of mucosa and submucosa only it is a partial tear of only mucosa and submucosa so no need to worry about it therefore what i am going to do it is a partial tear of mucosa and submucosa only therefore i have to treat them just with observation no need to worry at all 90% of the time the bleeding stops 90% of the time the bleeding stops so no need to worry at all we just wait and watch 90% stops in 10% patients who are bleeding we will do endoscopic coagulation we will do a endoscopic coagulation of the bleeding area so please don't forget this topic on 
Borav syndrome and Mallory Vistar. I want you to remember Borav syndrome and Mallory Vistar. Mallory Vistar, there is no further discussion. Mallory Vistar is due to tightly closed LES. The tear is in the lesser curvature below the OG junction. Just wait and watch. If it is not stopping, we have to go for endoscopic coagulation. That is enough for Mallory Vistar. Whereas Borav syndrome, I am discussing now the detailed management. Please do not forget the detailed management of Borav syndrome. It is a repeated AIMS PGH anterior question. There is a tear in the lower end of esophagus. There is a tear in the lower end of esophagus. So, what happens? This area is totally ruptured and all the food particles are entering the chest and causing mediastinitis. Left side, there is mediastinitis. So, immediately I will put a left thoracotomy. Immediate incision I will make is left thoracotomy I will make. I will put an incision in the left side chest that is left thoracotomy I will do. I will give wash, lavage of the left side chest and I will identify the rent and I will repair it. I will repair the rent. I will identify the rent and I will repair it. So, repair the uh, defect and I will keep an ICD inside the chest. Intercostal tube drainage will be kept inside the chest and I will come out. This is a normal treatment if the bed is healthy. So, in less than 24 hours, we can do this procedure. Thoracotomy, thoracotomy, lavage, repair and keep an ICD drain and come out. This is within 24 hours. If the patient comes after 24 hours, usually this area will go will be very bad. It will be full of necrotic and full of pus and debrided area. So, after 24 hours, if the tissue is unhealthy, unhealthy tissue, we have to go for a procedure known as this. I will bring the esophagus out like a esophagostomy. Through the chest, I will bring the esophagus. Esophagostomy. I will bring the esophagus as a esophagostomy and I will keep a ICD inside the chest and I will also do a close the stomach and I will also do a feeding tube either into the stomach or usually we do into the jejunum. We will do a feeding jejunostomy. This is what done for unhealthy mucosa which is usually happens after 24 hours. Which usually happens after 24 hours unhealthy mucosa. I will do a esophagostomy, intercostal drainage and I will do a feeding jejunostomy. We will repair after the patient recovers. But in whatever it may be, after 24 hours, there is high mortality seen. High mortality seen. So high mortality seen is seen in after 24 hours. And please don't forget if it is even if after 24 hours also, if the tissue is healthy, if the tissue is healthy, I can go for repair. If tissue is unhealthy, only I am telling you all these procedures. But after 24 hours, if the tissue is seen still healthy, you can do the repair. This is the line from Sabiston. So, if the tissue is healthy, we can go for repair. If it is unhealthy, go for ICD, esophagostomy and feeding jejunostomy. This is very important thing in Borav syndrome management. Borav syndrome management, please do not forget these points. This is Borav syndrome and Mallory Vistar. In an esophageal rupture, in an esophageal rupture, I told you there will be subcutaneous emphysema seen on x-ray. In an x-ray, if you take, this is an x-ray chest, this is heart, this is lungs. In an x-ray, you can see subcutaneous emphysema in the chest. That is one finding. And another finding in an x-ray chest, you can get is this sign. What is this sign? What is this? This is known as Neclerio V sign. Neclerio V sign. A V-shaped air in the chest. In the, in the media stenum, we have a V-shaped air known as Neclerio V sign at the level of cardiophrenic angle. That is a cardiophrenic angle. That place, you get a V-shaped air known as Neclerio V sign. I will show you the image in the image session. Do not worry, esophageal rupture. This is known as esophageal rupture. Please do not forget this esophageal rupture finding. So, this is one, one topic Borav syndrome and Mallory Vistar. One day, Ramu and Somu, they are going to do one more thing. They are Ramu and Somu, they decided to do suicide. Please remember, they are going to decide to suicide. So, they are thinking of drinking something and do a suicide. So, Ramu decided to drink alkali. So, Somu decided to drink acid. Okay, Somu decided to drink acid. So, alkali and acid they are going to drink. Now, Ramu is going to drink alkali, Somu is going to drink acid. So, you all know very well alkali is very tasty. So, Ramu will drink enormous amount. So, enormous amount consumed by Ramu. Whereas, acid is very, very, very uh, stingy sensation in the mouth. The moment they keep in the mouth, they will spit it out. So, very difficult. Little amount only consumed. He consumes only little amount. So, what happens in alkali, there is a problem that is known as liquefactive necrosis of esophagus. What happens to esophagus? It causes liquefactive necrosis of esophagus. 
whereas this acid causes coagulative necrosis of esophagus. So coagulative necrosis means it will form scar. it will form scar. So coagulative necrosis means it will form scar. So that prevents further damage of the esophagus. The moment they drink acid that will go to the esophagus and that forms a protective scar. so there is no perforation seen. Therefore, there is no perforation seen with acid drinking. Whereas alkali causes liquefactive necrosis, therefore the major problem perforation happens to this guy. They develop perforation. Because of this liquefactive necrosis, the esophagus develops perforation. So perforation is associated with alkali conception. Please remember this first point. And alkali conception causes esophageal damage more. Increase esophageal damage. Whereas as it causes gastric damage more. It, gastric increase damage, esophagus damage is very less. So, and also alkali damage, even if the patient recovers, they will develop a long term complication that is strictures in the esophagus. Strictures in esophagus develops in long term, by chance this fellow escapes and lives now, he will develop in future strictures in the esophagus and they also can develop squamous cell cancer of esophagus. Thousand times risk of squamous cell cancer is seen. Please remember. 1000 times risk of squamous cell cancer of esophagus is seen in alkali. So Ramu, even if he is going to survive this perforation, in future he can develop stricture in the esophagus, he can develop squamous cell cancer, like that he is going to suffer for lifetime. Whereas acid ingestion, it will cause only a short term damage. After few uh, months, what happens? These guys will not have much issue. So they will have a damage only for 6 months to 1 year. After that, that will become a static issue. After that, it will not be causing much problem. If at all, they can develop only antrum stricture, antral, gastric antral stricture only can develop in acid conception. So, acid and alkali conception, please don't forget, alkali conception causes liquefactive necrosis, acid causes coagulative necrosis and therefore no perforation in acid. Whereas, alkali causes esophageal perforation more commonly. So, alkali ingestion causing strictures in esophagus may need in future dilatation of the esophagus or they may need dilatation or they may even need coloplasty, coloplasty, we may need even a coloplasty, we will, we will go for a dilatation of the esophagus by means of special dilators are available like Savary Gillard dilators are there, special dilators, Savary Gillard dilators are available which are used to pass in the stricture and reduce to dilate or we can go for a coloplasty in which the esophagus stricture is left as such and we bring a colon as a substitute. So this is also done. We should not use gastric substitute because even the gastri gastric damage is still progressing. In future the patient may also develop gastric neck, uh, strictures. So better do not use thing therefore use only colon. Do not use stomach in corrosive ingestion. This, this heading is known as corrosive ingestion. And corrosive ingestion is a very important risk factor for long term squamous cell cancer. Corrosive ingestion are two types alkali and acid ingestion. So please do not forget here what happens to Ramo and Somu. So these are very important thing and all these things are taken together and we have a score for mortality. There is a score for mortality just to know the name as a PG level they won't ask you what are the factors but the score for mortality is known as Pittsburgh score. Pittsburgh score is a mortality score in esophageal perforation. Pittsburgh score is a mortality score in esophageal perforation. Please don't forget this. And just remember the name, that's enough. Pittsburgh score is a mortality score for esophageal perforation. I want you to tell you now, there is one table given, one point given in Bailey and Love. Bailey and Love says, I told you when there is an esophageal perforation, we have to go for surgery. What are all the indications of, what are all the indications of Non-operative management, very very important expected MCQ for your exams. Non-operative management of esophageal perforation. Non-operative management of esophageal perforation is an expected MCQ. That criteria we use is known as Cameroon criteria. Cameroon criteria of non-operative management. Which are the patients we can wait and watch? Number one, if it is an instrumental perforation, no need of surgery, we can wait and watch. Instrumental perforation. Because when you are going to do some endoscopy, definitely the patient will be in nil oral and there will be no contamination. Therefore, instrumental perforation, we can do non-operative management, number one. Number two, non-operative management is indicated for cervical esophageal perforation. 
cervical esophagus perforation number 2 cervical esophagus perforation we do non operative management number 3 i will go for non operative management if there is a low septic load if there is a low septic load i will go for a non operative management and if there is a draining collection there is a collection in the chest that is draining out it is not forming a permanent uh, we have put an icd and it is draining out through the icd there is a collection going that is draining out through the icd or it is draining back into the esophagus draining collection on contrast study so instrumental perforation cervical esophagus the perforation seen in this place cervical esophagus perforation low septic load and draining collection and patient is hemodynamically stable if you see the patient is hemodynamically stable we can manage by non operative measures by keeping them nil per oral and by putting a rails tube and by doing a feeding jejunostomy by doing a feeding jejunostomy or by we can also even do a nasogastric feeding we can put a tube through the rails tube and we can do a nasogastric feeding because we are definitely going to bypass this perforation area put a tube inside the stomach and we can do by that or if you are more concerned about some damage here we can even go for a without disturbing the esophagus we can go for a feeding jejunostomy so these are all indications of non operative management of esophageal perforation known as cameron criteria cameron criteria so now it's a point now to discuss about contrasts used in git contrasts used in git is a very important thing i want to tell you related to this esophageal perforation so there are three contrast we commonly use in entire gastrointestinal tract as a oral contrast we use we use the following so first one is non water soluble contrast please understand this very important topic i am discussing now non water soluble contrast the next one is water soluble contrast so contrast used in git non water soluble and water soluble water non water soluble is nothing but the barium sulfate the barium sulfate which i am going to dissolve in the water and i am going to ask the patient to drink that is barium sulfate barium sulfate powder is used to dissolve in the water the water becomes colorless water becomes white color and you ask the patient to drink that is barium sulfate contrast water soluble we have two types one is high osmolar contrast high osmolar water soluble contrast and another is low osmolar water soluble contrast can you tell me what is high osmolar water soluble contrast it is high osmolar water soluble contrast is gastrographin that is a company name we call gastrographin so gastrographin is a company name we commonly use in the practice and it is actually known as diatrazoate sodium diatrazoate it is actually actually composed of sodium diatrazoate that is high osmolar contrast low osmolar contrast we call it as iohexol it is actually composed of iodine please remember it is composed of iodine iodine based contrast so there are some more low osmolar like mypac omnipac so please don't forget this classification only when you know this classification you will understand further points i'm again telling you the contrast used are barium sulfate is a non water soluble gastrographin which is nothing but diatrazoate sodium is a water soluble low osmolar which is water soluble is iohexol so when you i'm going to discuss now what will you do for an esophageal perforation when a patient comes to you with a suspected esophageal perforation the contrast we first used is the first used contrast in studying first used contrast is gastrographin first used contrast is gastrographin but the disadvantage what is the disadvantage of using a gastrographin when i am going to use gastrographin it is less sensitive it is not so much 100% it will not pick up the perforation because it is like a water it will go inside it will be less sensitive that is one disadvantage second disadvantage is most important mcq if the patient aspirates gastrographin if he is unconscious and you are giving gastrographin by chance he aspirates into the lung that will go for pulmonary edema pulmonary edema may happen pulmonary edema is a complication because it is high osmolar it will absorb the fluid to become isoosmolar so it will cause pulmonary edema is a disadvantage so this is less sensitive i am telling you it is less sensitive but the 100% sensitive is barium sulfate 100% sensitive contrast to detect esophageal perforation gold standard contrast to detect esophageal 
perforation contrast of choice to detect esophageal perforation but why i am not using first you can you can assert then why don't you use barium why are you going for gastrographin you can use barium directly no i am not using barium barium is 100% sensitive barium is gold standard barium is a contrast of choice but i am not using this first because the barium remains in the chest for long period after doing this test the test barium will be remaining there itself in chest for long period and causes future confusion and future confusion arises in investigation if i am going to do further another investigation future that will cause more confusion so barium remains in the chest and causes future confusion so please don't forget this point so 100% sensitive gold standard contrast of choice is barium sulfate so barium remains in the chest and future confusion happens future confusion arises therefore barium is not the first used contrast if the first used contrast gastrographin looks normal and you still have a doubt of perforation you should go for barium if you use gastrographin if you have a so much of confusion still you are thinking it can be a esophageal perforation that such cases you go for barium sulfate so barium sulfate is not the first used it is second used i want to have a safest contrast i want to have a safest contrast they ask you safest contrast is iohexol no confusion in this guys please don't forget safest contrast is iohexol even if you aspirate nothing will happen even if it goes to the chest nothing will happen no issue at all safest contrast is iohexol now you can ask sir why are you not using iohexol it is costly so we cannot use it always so it is little costly so therefore we are using gastrographin first and investigation of choice is barium sulfate iohexol if you are affordable we use iohexol everywhere and iohexol contrast is the investigation of choice for tracheoesophageal fistula we will be discussing it in next session it is tracheoesophageal fistula this iohexol is the contrast of choice contrast of choice is iohexol so now this is a very basic thing please remember investigation of choice investigation of choice to detect to detect investigation of choice to detect early esophageal perforation last year jipmer question to detect early esophageal perforation is by means of cect thorax with oral contrast this is the answer please don't get confused in this cect thorax with the oral contrast is an investigation of choice to detect early esophageal perforation so this is the points from this chapter let me give a nutshell esophageal perforation most commonly due to instrumental perforation and most common site is cervical esophagus cervical esophagus is the most common site of perforation and the most common foreign body is a foot bolus and please don't forget about the two syndromes bor have versus mallory wester bor has versus mallory wester we have discussed so please don't forget bor has the tear is in the left lower posterior esophagus don't forget alkali conception versus acid conception alkali is the one who is going to cause esophageal perforation be careful with that and don't forget the cameron criteria for non operative management and don't forget the name pittsburg score for operative mortality pittsburg score don't forget that name and don't forget the contrast used to detect esophageal perforation contrast used in esophageal perforation please don't forget this thing so these are all the important points i want you to remember for your exams high yield exam question for you okay thank you